Hi students. Well, we're going to continue our discussion of earnings per share. Just recall that this is a required portion or part of the income statement. It goes below net income, so not including any of the uh, OCI items, just net income. Now we talked about basic EPS. Now we're going to look at a company that has a, a complex capital structure. And here's what we mean. We just mean that there are outstanding securities that if they were converted to uh, common shares could end up reducing the EPS for the year. So when we talk about these securities, they have to be convertible. So we're talking about convertible preferred shares, perhaps. We're talking about uh, stock options, talking about convertible bonds. So if you have these in your company, then you have a complex capital structure. Now that's not necessarily going to give you a lower EPS, but most often it will. So really when we look at diluted EPS, which is kind of what we're getting at here, diluted EPS is worst case scenario. If all of these convertible securities that would make EPS lower had been converted, then what would EPS have been? So one thing you, I guess, need to realize about diluted EPS, fully diluted EPS, is it is an imaginary number. It did not really happen. We're just saying, what if? So the reason we do this is that shareholders might want to know how low EPS would go if these um, convertible securities were actually exercised. So we have to calculate this, it's required under IFRS. So let's <coughs> kind of look at this. Now we're gonna do this in two parts because there are actually two methods you need to use depending uh, which convertible security you're trying to figure out. Okay. Now, before we move on, I'll just mention if you calculate a number and it is higher than um, basic EPS or higher than your you know EPS so far, and I'll I'll show you that later, then you ignore it. Okay. So we're only going to count uh, secure, convertible securities that cause EPS to go down, none that cause it to go up. So again, it's worst case scenario that we're gonna look at. So this particular video is gonna look at um, the uh, if converted method here, okay? So there's two methods and there's a treasury stock method that we're gonna look at in the next video and I thought we would just do these over two videos. So if converted, we're using for convertible securities such as preferred shares and convertible bonds. So all we do is we say, well, if this, as long as the security was outstanding for the whole year, we say, okay, we're gonna assume it was converted at the beginning of the year. So if we're looking at debt and bonds, here's what we would do. We would adjust our net income for the change that would occur if we had converted those at the beginning of the year. And this example is using bonds first and then at the end I'm just gonna make up an example for you and we'll just kind of look at um, preferred shares. But it'll be a, a different example. Okay, so one thing you need to keep in mind is that dividends to uh, preferred shareholders come from after-tax income. So dividends don't have a tax saving. So in other words, you know, if the corporation pays shareholders a dividend, that doesn't save them any tax. So $100 of dividends that you don't pay saves you $100. Now, that's not the same case with interest is it so if if you pay interest 
to you know a creditor, that's an expense. And because it's an expense, you get a tax break on that expense. So you know you save the tax essentially. So think of it this way: if we if we don't pay that expense interest, then we don't have the tax savings anymore. And again, I'm, I know this is kind of a strange concept because it's all made up to begin with, but we have to still think what would happen if we, if let's say we paid $100 interest and now we're saying, what would it look like if we did not pay that $100? Well, if we didn't pay it, we would not have saved the tax. So we have to calculate the net of tax or after tax interest saved when we look at convertible debt. So let's go through this example. So here's our net income for the year, 410,000. And we're gonna just say that we had 100,000 uh, common shares outstanding during the whole period. And no preferred shares in this example. Now, we, here's what we did have. We had a million dollars outstanding in convertible bonds. So a convertible bond means that it could be converted to uh, common shares at the discretion of the bondholder. So to keep things sort of simple, these were 6% bonds issued at par. And the million dollars worth of bonds can be converted to 20,000 common shares. And our tax rate is 30%. So if you recall that EPS uses income as a numerator and number of shares as a denominator, that's what we're going to calculate here. So first, we need to know what basic EPS is. And I mean, that's not too challenging for us right now, I think. We have $410,000 divided by 100,000 shares, so our basic EPS is 410. Now let's look at the bonds themselves. Now we're going to look at the bonds in isolation, so just the bonds. Okay, and I'm going to put a dollar sign here because that's money. So 6% on a million dollars is $60,000. The 30% tax savings we would lose, so our, our total savings, or let's say, change in net income, I guess, would be $42,000 if these had con been converted at the beginning of the year. So again, at the beginning of the year, it means we would never have paid that 60,000 interest, but we would not have received the 18,000 tax benefit. So if these had been converted at the beginning of the year, our net income would be $42,000 more. And you know, just given, they convert to 20,000 common shares. So what we need to do is we need to find out if these are dilutive all by themselves. And to do that, we get sort of an individual EPS number just for the bonds. So let's look at that. So here we've got our $42,000 divided by our 20,000 shares is 210. So absolutely this is dilutive, that means we have to include it on our income statement and show shareholders fully diluted EPS. So the next question is, well, what is fully diluted EPS? And I think you'll find out that this part is actually a pretty easy part. So here's what we do. We start with net income for the year, which was our uh, figure for basic EPS, we add the 42,000 increase in income that would have happened if the bonds had been converted and our adjusted net income is 452. Now our shares were 100,000. We would have issued 20. We would have therefore had 120,000 shares. And this is what we would end up with. We would end up with 452 numerator 120 denominator. Now this this method I showed you is okay to illustrate with you know one example, but it's not 
a method that's going to work for you really, really well, pretty close. But let's look at a table method, and this is what you should be doing sort of at the end of every EPS question or calculation anyway. So here's how we do this. We're going to take four columns, and here's the item on the left. Here's the numerator, the denominator, so money, shares, and EPS. So what we do is we start with basic EPS, and we get 410. Then we take the bonds that we know to be dilutive, because we checked them against the 410, and we put in the numerator amount and the denominator, and then we simply add those two on the next line, and we get 377. Now, at this point, you're thinking, hmm, that's nice, but it didn't really seem that necessary. But once we put, let's say, three different things in here, then this table format is really going to help you out. So um, I mentioned we would just talk briefly about preferred shares as well. So without kind of a whole different uh, example with basic EPS, let's just look at what happens with preferred shares. So we had $410,000 available to common shareholders. That was our net income. And we had 100,000 shares outstanding for the full period. Okay, so let's um, just change this up and let's say that in addition we have 10,000 convertible preferred shares. Each uh, preferred share has a $5 dividend and the conversion rate is one preferred to three common shares. Now the first thing we want to really look at here and understand is that this dividend is $50,000. So that $50,000 is not available for common shareholders. So here's, here's what we actually would end up with for basic EPS. We would have $360,000 of income for 100,000 common shares. And that's of course because the first 50 comes off the top for the preferred share dividend. Okay, so you can see what happens then. Our basic EPS, if we have these preferred shares, turns into $3.60. So just like we did with bonds, we want to find out what would be the individual effect of these preferred shares on EPS if they were converted. So note that they are converted one preferred to three common shares. So that means 30,000 common shares. Now the income effect is 50,000, isn't it? Because we've got um, we've got, sorry, we have a $5 dividend times 10,000 shares. Okay, so let's look at the individual effect of these. Here if we, if we converted these, we would not pay the $50,000 because it would have been converted to common. And what we would end up with is an additional 30,000 shares. Okay, so if we divide that out, we get $1.66. So the individual number for these is $1.66. So that, as you can see, is like totally dilutive. So now we're going to say, well, what is diluted EPS? So if, you, if these preferred shares were converted, then you would never pay the $50,000, right? So you would be back to 410000 However, you would now have 130,000 common shares outstanding. So we end up with 410 divided by 130, and our diluted EPS is now 315. Okay, so 
this is still the if converted method. We've just applied it to preferred shares. So here is where you would end up if those shares had been um, converted at the beginning of the year. So on your income statement, you're going to have a line that says basic EPS. And remember, if those, um, if those items were actually there, if the preferred were there, then your basic EPS would have been 360. And then you're going to have a line for diluted EPS. And that diluted EPS is going to be 315. So in the next video, we're going to look at a, a slightly even more interesting method called the treasury stock method. And that's the one that we use for options.